program. I'm Lee Ji-yoon in Seoul. Today, President Moon Jae-in will be delivering the 42nd Singapore Lecture titled ROK and ASEAN Partners for Achieving Peace and Co-Prosperity in East Asia. During his speech, Mr. Moon will lay out his vision and policies for denuclearizing North Korea and establishing long-term peace on the Korean Peninsula. The Singapore Lecture is known to provide an opportunity for distinguished leaders to reach a wider audience in Singapore on various issues. We'll be bringing you a live coverage of the president's speech in just a bit. But first, let's get started with a look at today's headlines. The leaders of South Korea and Singapore agreed to continue efforts to bring lasting peace to the Korean Peninsula and for Singapore to keep playing a constructive role after hosting the summit last month. U.S. President Donald Trump releases a letter he recently received from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and says great progress is being made in talks with Pyongyang. South Korea's import price index rises for the sixth straight month in June as a strengthening greenback pushes up local import prices. President Moon Jae-in says North Korea-U.S. denuclearization talks, although it may take some time, are on the right track. He made the remarks during his bilateral summits with the president and prime minister of Singapore on day two of his three-day state visit there. Our chief Blue House correspondent Moon Gan Young reports. Despite possible obstacles down the road, North Korea-U.S. negotiations are on the right track. That South Korean President Moon Jae-in as he held bilateral summits with the President and Prime Minister of Singapore. Standing in the city city where exactly one month ago stood the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump for their historic summit, the South Korean leader carefully predicted that the June 12th summit may lead to success if North Korea implements complete denuclearization and the international community join efforts to guarantee security for the North. 영내 평화와 안정을 위해서도 공조를 강화하기로 했습니다. Constructive dialogue is necessary in order to achieve peace and stability in the peninsula. Such remarks come amid a possible gap between North Korea and the U.S. on how to move ahead with the denuclearization process, which became more apparent following U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's latest trip to Pyongyang. According to the South Korean leader's chief press secretary, President Moon also noted although working-level negotiations may take time, now is a better time than ever to finally rid North Korea of its nuclear mission. The president also made note of what North Korea is demanding in return for its denuclearization measures, not the removal of sanctions or economic compensation, but rather the end of hostilities and trust. Analysts say it's the facilitator or the negotiator in action as it tries to move forward the U.S.-North Korea denuclearization process as it appears to have hit a stall. Traveling with the South Korean president, Moon Gonyoung, Arirang News, Singapore. President Moon also attended the South Korea-Singapore Business Forum as well as the dinner banquet hosted by the Singaporean president on Thursday. Our Blue House correspondent Hwang Ho-jun has more. A friendship that is solid as gold and sweet as a fragrant orchid. That is how President Moon described the close friendship between Seoul and Singapore during a state banquet hosted by the Singaporean President Halima Yaakob. It was a nod to an earlier event that President Moon and his wife, First Lady Kim Jong-suk, attended at the Singapore Botanic Gardens, where a newly cultured orchid was named after the first couple. On Thursday afternoon, in front of about 300 business leaders from both countries gathered at Singapore's Shangri-La Hotel, President Moon also called for Singapore's active support for his new southern policy, especially with Singapore chairing the 2018 ASEAN summit. It was November last year when the South Korean president first introduced his vision to, quote, dramatically strengthen Seoul's cooperation with ASEAN nations by focusing on the three Ps, people-centered exchanges, mutual prosperity, and peace. President Moon highlighted three ways to bring about future-oriented cooperation between the two countries. He first said Korea and Singapore will secure future growth engines together in response to the fourth industrial revolution, especially by promoting the active participation of small businesses and innovative startups in the process.
The president also emphasized that bilateral economic cooperation must work effectively to benefit the people of both countries, and that South Korea and Singapore must work together to prevent the spread of protectionism, noting that the foundation for the two countries' economic growth has been free trade and openness. President Moon Jae-in ended a speech with the expression, Majula Singapura, Malay for Onward Singapore. Even during the business forum, President Moon asked again for Singapore's continued support for establishing lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. He stressed if South Korea and Singapore go onward, or Majula together, not only Korea but the entire ASEAN will enjoy peace and co-prosperity. Hong Jun, Arirang News, Singapore. U.S. President Donald Trump shared a letter he received from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Twitter. Now, this letter comes despite concerns that Kim is taking little action towards surrendering his nuclear weapons. Our Lee Seung-jae tells us more. President Trump revealed a letter from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un via Twitter on Thursday with a message that read a very nice note from Chairman Kim of North Korea, with Trump adding that great progress is being made. Along with the message were two images of the letter, one in Korean and the other in English. Dated July 6, the note was likely the one given to U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo during his visit to Pyongyang last week. In the letter, the North Korean leader expresses deep appreciation for the extraordinary efforts made by President Trump for the improved bilateral relations between the two countries and the faithful implementation of the joint statement referring to the agreement signed by the two leaders at their summit in Singapore last month. Kim added that with a strong will, sincere efforts and unique approach by the two leaders, a new future will happen, expressing optimism for the two countries and their relations. Meanwhile, attending the annual NATO summit in Brussels on Thursday, both President Trump and Pompeo expressed their confidence in the diplomatic process with the North. Pompeo said his counterpart Kim Young-chul made a commitment, adding that North Korea intends to denuclearize. But the big question remains on when the complete denuclearization will actually begin, as the two countries continue to discuss ways to make their commitments in their Singapore agreement a reality. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. So in just a few minutes, like I said in the beginning of our newscast, that President Moon Jae-in will be giving a lecture titled Republic of Korea and ASEAN, Partners for Achieving Peace and Co-Prosperity in East Asia, as part of a series of Singapore lectures delivered by world leaders on current affairs. Now, the special lecture uh, for Singapore's top opinion leaders will help to provide an insight on how South Korea tries to uh, provide and denuclearize North Korea and establish lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula amid recent developments with, that we've been seeing surrounding North Korea. And the Singapore lecture is one of the intellectual highlights of Singapore, which gives an opportunity for distinguished statesmen and leaders like President Moon Jae-in to reach a wider audience in the country and for the audience to hear from leading world figures speak on topics of global and regional interest. And Mr. Moon's trip to Singapore follows his two historic summits with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, which were held on April 27th and also on May 26th, as well as the historic summit between Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump in Singapore on June 12th. Now, according to the Blue House, during the lecture, President Moon will be explaining Seoul's vision and policy for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, as well as ways to bring lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula and also his new southern policy that aims to upgrade South Korea's cooperation with ASEAN member nations. And with that, let's uh, take a look at the video. As a lawyer, There's President the Moon sitting next to him, about to uh, start the lecture. He was heavily involved in the 2007 inter-Korean summit between President Moon and former DPRK leader Kim Jong-il which led to the Declaration for Advancing Inter-Korean Relations and Peace and Prosperity. President Moon's dedication and pursuit of peace has been well received by the Korean people. President Moon's speech today is very timely. The situation on the Korean Peninsula is of global concern and of course, concern to all of us here in the region. There have been significant developments since the beginning of this year. And President Moon, in particular, has played a key role to create the conditions 
for a return to dialogue, beginning with the hosting of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics and the two inter-Korean summits. Complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula will take time, and it is therefore important for all stakeholders to continue to work together and support ongoing efforts to achieve lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. President Moon is eminently qualified and we are distinctly privileged to have him address us this morning. And it is now my pleasure to invite His Excellency, President Moon Jae-in, to deliver the 42nd Singapore Lecture on ROK and ASEAN, Partners for Achieving Peace and Co-Prosperity in East Asia. I give you President Moon. Thank you for the introduction. Honorable citizens of Singapore, ladies and gentlemen, the North Korea-U.S. summit has now lit up the road to peace. First of all, I would like to extend my appreciation to the people and government of Singapore for providing support to make the summit of the century a big success. Singapore is the world's leader when it comes to Asian studies and is leading the Asian value. I feel a sense of friendship towards the Institute of Southeast Asia Studies that has invited me for the Singapore lecture today. Last year, last year in Manila, the Philippines, I met with Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung. We promised to visit each other as early as possible. And I'm very delighted that we've finally met. Honorable people of Singapore, Singapore is peace itself. We cannot talk about peace without mentioning Singapore. Singapore, which started off as a small fishing village, has now established peace and prosperity. When hostility prevailed during the times of Cold War and Confrontasi, uh, Singapore led the initiative of establishing the ASEAN and dialogue. It also established the value of ASEAN-centered, and it has contributed greatly to the expansion of ASEAN through ASEAN Plus 3, as well as the East Asia Summit. Southeast Asia is now, now able to sustain peace thanks to the ASEAN. Sustainable regional stability was possible due to the third road of regional cooperation, and Singapore stood at the forefront of establishing peace. Southeast Asia is the world's most diverse region. It's where Muslim, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Taoism, Conf Confucianism, and Socialism coexist. ASEAN has become a model that showcases the diverse civilizations can coexist in a peaceful manner. Now the peace established together by Singapore and the ASEAN has garnered international attention. If we can call the 21st century an era of peace and coexistence, the 21st century can also be called the century for ASEAN. And I believe that at its center lies Singapore. South Korea yearns for peace. There is no other nation that is more desperate to establish peace than South Korea. We have lost everything through war and have endured enormous pains under the threat of war. I myself am a son of a refugee who went aboard a vessel for refugees with nothing in their hands and leaving behind their homes, and thus I know how crucial and important peace is. The consistent effort exerted by Singapore to establish peace has made it to the venue for the North Korea-U.S. summit. I believe that the support of Singapore's people who have established peace made the North Korea-U.S. summit a big success. 
I highly respect the efforts exerted by the ASEAN and Singapore to establish peace, and I would like to ask you to walk together with us towards a greater prosperity through peace. Honorable citizens of Singapore, ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN is South Korea's partner that will make a peaceful community together. It is also a trade partner as well as an investment, des uh, investment destination that will achieve economic development together. Now our relationship is moving beyond one of a neighbors and developing into that of a family. I have acknowledged the importance of ASEAN and have exerted my efforts to usher in a new future together with ASEAN. After taking office in May last year, I was the first to send a special envoy to the region aiming to make closer ties with ASEAN. In September, the ASEAN Culture House was established in my hometown of Busan, being the first ASEAN partner to do so. In November, I declared the new Southern policy after visiting Vietnam, Indonesia and the Philippines. In March this year, I revisited Vietnam and agreed with President Chen Dai Quang to uh, strengthen practical cooperation for regional peace and co-prosperity. And before coming here, I also met with Indian Prime Minister Modi to carry out deeper coordination and future-oriented cooperation within the framework of regional multilateral consultative body. Since the establishment of diplomatic ties in 1975, Singapore and South Korea have been pursuing common goals of free and open economy as well as establishing regional peace and stability. The two nations have overcome numerous challenges after being independent from colonization. Although both nations did not have natural resources, we considered our people as our hope and nurtured our talents. Thanks to the energy of our people, we have made possible remarkable economic growth, which is often dubbed the miracle of the equator and the miracle on the Han River. Yesterday, Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung and I have agreed on detailed measures to develop the Singapore ROK ties a step further. We will expand exchanges in order to nurture our talents. We will carry out economic cooperation, which our people will able to benefit from. South Korea's companies have already proactively participated in establishing and building Singapore's major landmark buildings. Going forward, we will prepare the era of the fourth industrial revolution together and witness closer cooperation for regional peace and prosperity. ASEAN and South Korea mutually benefit each other by complementing what each other lacks. We are indeed the optimal companions to usher in a future of peace and co-prosperity. I aim to upgrade and develop our relationship with ASEAN to the level of our relationship with major countries surrounding the Korean Peninsula, including the U.S., China, Japan and Russia. This is my strategic vision and I'm emphasizing the new Southern policy. New Southern policy is about establishing a future-oriented partnership for people, co-prosperity and peace with Southeast Asian countries, including Singapore. It's about meeting more often, expanding the opportunity for co prosperity through practical cooperation and contributing to world peace, moving beyond the Korean Peninsula and ASEAN. Singapore, as the chair of ASEAN this year, is leading the region's peace and prosperity. It's also a core partner for our new southern policy. I hope to see ASEAN and South Korea develop bilateral ties with the proactive help by Singapore. Honorable people of Singapore, Singapore is a balance within Asia, 
and it's also a melting pot where of Eastern and Western civilizations. It's a small nation, but has a large room for embracement. One can find a Buddhist temple, Hindu temple, Christian church, Islam mosque, Taoist temple in a single street, and people who work at 9,000 multinational co corporations are walking down this avenue. It is also renowned globally for its harmony and concord among multi-races and multicultures. Above all, what I respect the most is the fact that it's creating ideologies without making ideological prejudice and being swayed by ideologies. It's also a society that prioritizes a practicality that is focused on talent and is a nation that boasts integrity. Also, it has the world's most fair judicial system. This uh, is probably where Singapore's energy that has established harmony and concord originates. South Korea has been ailing long due to the long confrontation of ideologies. The divisions of the two Koreas have tolerated corruption, privilege and injustice that have been described as ideologies, and thus we have wasted our energy. This is something to be ashamed of. Yet we are indeed making a fair and just society. And in this process, there are a lot to learn from Singapore. I believe that the power of Singapore to imagine and act boldly all comes from its talent, practicality, integrity and fairness. And with such energy, Singapore has processed over one-seventh of the world's transshipment amount and has now become the world's second largest container port. Singapore's next generation national vision of smart nation project is a preemptive response for the fourth industrial revolution on a national basis. One of such innovative projects is self-driving taxis. The aim of Singapore to make the environment and quality of life better through better public transportation will transform the thoughts of the people who prefer to drive their own cars. With its innovative economic and social policies, Singapore is presenting a new road for the humanity. And looking at Singapore's spirit of challenge, I am certain that we are assuring in an era for Asia. I also aim to make South Korea a nation that can have bold imaginations. Korea has one opportunity that Singapore or no other nation has. It is the inter-Korean economic cooperation. The inter-Korean summit is just the beginning. Until last year, this was something that people only dreamed of. Based on complete denuclearization and peace on the Korean peninsula, Korea will map out a new economic map. South and North Korea will go towards making an economic community. We will make our countries into a platform where anyone can exert their talents fairly. And we will make a Korean peninsula where prosperity blossoms are based on peace. Once peace is established on the Korean Peninsula together with Singapore and ASEAN, Asia will be the most prosperous region in the world. And it will be the beacon of hope that shines on the future of the humanity. Honorable people of Singapore, the leaders of South and North Korea and the United States have shifted the direction of history with the Panmunjom Declaration between the two Koreas and the joint statement issued after the North Korea-U.S. summit. We have taken a step forward with confidence to establish a complete denuclearization and everlasting peace on the Korean peninsula. 
I am President Trump share the same view that we will resolve the North Korean nuclear issue based on robust ROK-US alliance. Based on such shared view, South Korea and the U.S. have shared the process of historic transformation from North Korea's participation of the Pyeongchang Olympics, the mutual visits of their envoys, to the inter-Korean summit as well as the North-U.S. summit. And we will continue to be together going forward. I have also established close cooperation and coordination as well as communication with Prime Minister Abe with the common goal of establishing complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. The normalization of relations between the two Koreas has led to normalization of relations between the North and the U.S., and it will further lead to the normalization of relations between the North and Japan. This will contribute to the peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula as well as Northeast Asia. To this end, we aim to cooperate with Japan in earnest. During the South Korea-China-Japan trilateral summit held in Japan in May, Japan and Korea, uh, China congratulated the successful hosting of inter-Korean summit, and they have also made clear their proactive support for the faithful implementation of the Panmunjom Declaration. In December last month, I visited Beijing and met with Prime, uh, President Xi Jinping. We talked in depth about issues on the Korean Peninsula, and we confirmed uh, that we will cooperate closely to resolve the North's nuclear issue in a peaceful manner. Last month, I met with uh, President Putin in Russia, and we agreed to prepare uh, for a trilateral cooperation among the two Koreas and Russia. We also agreed to intensify our cooperation so that peace and prosperity can be enjoyed on the Korean Peninsula as well as Eurasia. And I met twice with uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un of the DPRK. Chairman Kim was strongly willing to develop North Korea into a normal state, moving away from ideological confrontations. If Chairman Kim follows on through follows through on his promise for denuclearization, he can indeed make his country move towards uh, prosperity. It may not be an easy road ahead, but an earnest implementation of the agreement reached between the two leaders can help us achieve our goal. We will able to speed up the process if North Korea comes up with detailed plans for denuclearization and when South Korea and U.S. lay out comprehensive measures that go parallel with such plans. My administration will exert its full efforts to begin economic cooperation by making a peace regime as soon as possible. We will continue to cooperate with the international community to make Panmunjom Declaration and Sentosa Agreement become agreements that end the last remains of the uh, Cold War. Honorable citizens of Singapore, ladies and gentlemen, just as you have done so far, I look forward for a constructive role by Singapore and ASEAN. ASEAN and South Korea have shared the same goal, that a peace regime should be established on the Korean Peninsula and that uh, the North's nuclear issue must be resolved in a peaceful manner to enable regional peace and stability. Since year 2000 in particular, ASEAN has provided a communicative channel between North Korea and the rest of the international community through the ASEAN Regional Forum. The ARF is the only multinational conference that is participated by North Korea and has become a valuable communication channel between the North and the international community. In addition, ASEAN has consistently been vocal that North Korea abandons its nuclear weapons and missiles development and return to the road for peace and prosperity. The road for cooperation between Korea and ASEAN during our journey to establish peace on the Korean Peninsula is not far away. As the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic did in February, I sincerely hope that the Asian Games to be held in Indonesia next month 
will become a platform of harmony that contributes to peace on the Korean Peninsula. It's important to embrace North Korea into the numerous cooperation and exchange promotion frameworks that are already established between South Korea and ASEAN. Once North Korea implements uh, the measures towards denuclearization in earnest, I hope that ASEAN can invite the North into its various consultative bodies, which will then intensify cooperation with North Korea. ASEAN has established mutual economic cooperation relations with North Korea even before the international society's sanctions against the North for its uh, nuclear development. Moreover, with the ROK ASEAN FTA, it has provided support for the inter-Korean economic cooperation by imposing the same tariff cuts on products manufactured at the Kaesong Industrial Complex as those produced in South Korea. The economic cooperation between North Korea and ASEAN that have once been very active will resume once international sanctions against the North are lifted following the North's complete denuclearization. And this is expected to contribute to the economic development of both the North and ASEAN. Peace on the Korean Peninsula will move forward, becoming a point of contact that connects the economies of ASEAN and Korea, as well as North Korea and Eurasia. And thus, it will create new economic growth engines for nations within the region, including the member states of ASEAN. Honorable citizens of Singapore, ladies and gentlemen, what Singapore has achieved through its harmony is the ideology of the humanity in the 21st century. At a time when the East meets West and the Southern Hemisphere meets with the Northern Hemisphere, Singapore stands at the juncture as a melting pot. It's also lighting up the light of Asia. I'm certain that Singapore will make another miracle moving beyond the achievements made during the past five decades. Like it did so far, Singapore will stand at the forefront of establishing ASEAN's peace and prosperity, and I confirm and firmly believe that it will be uh, with us in achieving the Korean Peninsula's goal of complete denuclearization and peace. Let us usher in an era of peace based on peace in Asia, and let us make the hope of humanity based on the prosperity of Asia. At the border village of Panmunjom on Thursday, the North Koreans were a no-show for their scheduled working-level talks with U.S. officials on the repatriation of American troops killed in the North during the Korean War. Their rescheduled date is this Sunday, July 15th. Our Park Ki jun has more. Officials from North Korea were expected to meet Thursday with UN command officials representing the United States to discuss repatriating the remains of American troops who went missing in action during the Korean War. Returning the remains was something North Korean leader Kim Jong-un promised to do when he met last month with U.S. President Donald Trump in Singapore, and it was considered a huge step forward in building trust between Pyongyang and Washington. Talks on implementing the agreement were due to be held on Thursday at the Chu's village of Panmunjom, as arranged last week in Pyongyang by U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and senior North Korean official Kim Young-chol. The U.S. had already sent 100 wooden caskets to Panmunjom to carry the soldiers' remains back home once an agreement was reached. But North Korean officials never showed up. According to the U.S. State Department, the North contacted the U.S. side later in the day, offering to hold the talks on Sunday instead. Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, citing government sources, also reported that Pyongyang proposed holding them at the general level, strongly hinting that the North wants a senior U.S. military official present at the negotiations. Sources say North Korea made a direct call to the U.N. command through a line that was suspended for five years after North Korea called off the signing of a ceasefire agreement in 2013. Pyongyang is known to have asked for the military channel to be restored and, after it was restored, to have asked for understanding for the delay that was caused by its lack of preparation. 
The State Department accepted a proposal, and so the two sides will finally meet for their overdue talks on Sunday to carry out the agreement from the Singapore summit. Park Ki-jun, Arirang News. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he sees the talks between North Korea and the U.S. on denuclearization as very good possibilities that could lead to a positive solution despite the ups and downs along the way. In a news conference held Thursday, the U.N. chief said he sees the denuclearization talks as a complex but essential process for global peace and security, and that all U.N. bodies, including its nuclear agency, will remain available for assistance. Guterres asked all countries in the region to help facilitate talks so that agreements can be reached on the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea's table tennis team is to arrive in South Korea this Sunday to participate in the 2018 Korea Open table tennis competition in Daejeon. The North's team is comprised of 16 table tennis players and nine officials and will be led by Kim Song Yi, the 2016 Olympic bronze medalist in the women's singles. The Korea Table Tennis Association says it will discuss with North Korea about forming joint teams in the men's and women's doubles for the competition. And chances are high that female players will form joint teams as they already have experience of joining forces at the World Championships in May. The North Korean team will return home on Monday, July 23rd. South Korea's National Assembly has convened an extraordinary session that will run for the next two weeks. Bringing an end to over 40 days of inaction, rival parties started by electing a parliamentary speaker and two vice speakers for the latter half of the 20th National Assembly. For the latest, we connect to our political correspondent Kim Minji. So Minji, fill us in. Jiyun, as you touched upon, the National Assembly is back in action after more than six weeks of inactivity. Now, the latter half of the 20th National Assembly kicked off with the electing of the Assembly Speaker and two Vice Speakers, filling in the key Assembly leadership posts that have sat vacant for over a month. During a plenary session this morning, rival lawmakers elected Moon Hee Sang, a six-term lawmaker of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea, as the new National Assembly Speaker. Now, it's been customary for the largest party, currently the ruling Democratic Party of Korea, to take the Speaker position. In a short speech following his nomination, the new Speaker emphasized the importance of cooperation. Managing state affairs through dialogue, compromise and cooperation will be the destiny of the 20th National Assembly. I promise that cooperation will also be prioritized over the next two years. It will be the ruling party's responsibility to work on bills related to reform and the people's livelihoods. They must not blame the opposition bloc. But at the same time, the opposition also needs to show sincerity in negotiations. They must make demands but also make concessions when necessary. Now, Moon, who will leave the ruling party to go on as an independent, will be at the helm until May 2020 when the 20th National Assembly comes to an end. Now, two vice speakers were also elected, five-term lawmaker Lee Ju Young from the main opposition Liberty Korea Party and four-term lawmaker Chu Sung Yong from the minor Padamita Party, the second and third largest parties respectively. So this is just a start. I mean, we understand arrival parties have a lot on their play for the duration of this July session. Yes, you're right. Due to over a month of paralysis, they've got a stack of agenda items to work through. Now, next Monday, a plenary session will be held to finalize the makeup of the Parliament's 18 standing committees. The ruling party will chair eight of them, the main opposition seven, the Padamita Party two, and the joint bloc of the Party for Democracy and Peace and the Justice Party will head up one. Um, rival lawmakers will also vote on a revision to the National Assembly Act to separate the Committee on Education, Culture, Sports and Tourism into two separate ones, one in charge of education and the other the remaining affairs. Also on the agenda are confirmation hearings for the candidate for a Commissioner General of the National Police Agency and three nominees for Supreme Court Justices. Now, although we are back on track, and despite the fact that it was a much-needed breakthrough, there are concerns of political wrangling down the line, with rival parties expected to clash during the upcoming confirmation hearings, not to mention the mountain of disputed bills that have to be reviewed. Back to you, Jean. 
Thank you, Minji, for that. A government commission is holding discussions today to decide the country's minimum wage for next year after it raised the hourly pay by 16.4% this year. The 27-member panel, comprised of those representing labor, employers, and the public interest, are expected to narrow their differences. The gap between the two sides is still huge, with labor representatives demanding the minimum wage be set at over 10,001, or roughly $9.60, up over 43%, and the employers' representatives hoping to keep the minimum wage at the same level as this year, which is around $6.70 an hour. With the Moon administration's pledge to raise the hourly minimum wage floor at least $8.90, watchers expect an upward adjustment to at least $7. US dollars. South Korea's central bank has released its data on the nation's export and import prices for last month, which showed that both indexes are on a rise. Here's our Kim hae with more details. South Korea's import prices went up for the sixth consecutive month in June due to the weakening Korea won. The Bank of Korea says the import price index rose 1.3 percent on month, recording 88.26 in June. Compared to the same period last year, the index is up nearly 11 percent, marking the biggest jump in 17 months. The local currency weakened against the U.S. dollar, recording an average of 1,092.81 last month, pushing up Korea's import prices despite a slight fall in global oil prices. In particular, raw material prices went up 1.4 percent on month, or more than 26 percent on year. Without the change in the $1 exchange rate, the Bank of Korea says June's import prices would have ticked down 0.1 percent on month. Export prices edged up around 1 percent on month to 85.68, continuing its upward streak for a third consecutive month. The central bank attributes the rising export prices to an increase in industrial goods prices, including metals and machinery. Export and import prices affect future consumer prices, so this could mean higher inflation in the months to come. Kim hye Arirang News. And on to the latest on Samsung Biologics and the accounting fraud scandal swirling around the firm. The Financial Supervisory Service says the 2015 accounting breach by the Samsung affiliate was intentional, and the biopharmaceutical firm clearly violated accounting rules. The financial regulator adds it will refer the case to the prosecution. Now the decision comes after a months-long review of the company's bookkeeping when it switched in 2015 to valuing its stakes in drug maker Samsung Bioepis at fair market value instead of at book value. Following the announcement, Samsung Biologics expressed regret, adding that it had no motive to intentionally violate accounting rules and that it will consider taking legal action against the ruling. China's Commerce Ministry has said it's currently not engaged in trade talks with the U.S., accusing Washington of escalating trade tensions between the two countries. Spokesman Gao Feng told a regular briefing on Thursday that Beijing resolutely opposes America's trade bullying behavior, warning that China will have no choice but to strike back. He added that China lost its trust in the U.S., which he said was a precondition for trade negotiations. On Tuesday, the Trump administration slapped new 10 percent tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports. U.S. President Donald Trump has hailed the NATO summit as a success, saying members are now committed to paying more for the alliance's defense. However, some allies have cast doubt over his claims. Our Nuaram has the story. The past two days saw President Trump give a mixture of jibes and praise towards NATO members. But in the end, he left satisfied. Trump told a press conference on Thursday that all NATO members agreed to increase their defense spending after he told them he was extremely unhappy. The day before, he suggested NATO allies double their military spending to 4 percent of their GDP, saying the U.S. was paying that much. NATO figures, however, show America spent 3.5 percent this year. Trump has repeatedly threatened to pull the U.S. out of NATO if burden sharing was not improved. When asked if that threat still stands, President Trump said he could, but no longer saw the need. I think I probably can, but that's unnecessary. And uh, the people have stepped up today like they've never stepped up before. And remember the word, $33 billion more they're paying. And you'll hear that from the Secretary General in a little while. He thanked me, actually. However, some NATO members cast doubt on Trump's claims that they had pledged to substantially raise their defense budgets. 
They said they simply agreed to a 2014 deal to spend 2% of their GDP by the year 2024. However, NATO's chief, Jens Stoltenberg, did note that President Trump's rhetoric did create a sense of urgency. Noara Arirang News. Meanwhile, President Trump is now in the UK for a four-day visit. He and his wife, Millennia, met British Prime Minister Theresa May for a black tie dinner with business leaders at Blenheim Palace in London. During the dinner, they reaffirmed their strong alliance and vowed to jointly fight against terrorism and Russian aggression. They also touched upon post-Brexit trade. But in an interview with Britain's Sun newspaper published late Thursday, Trump blasted May's plan, plans for a business-friendly Brexit, saying that her approach could imperil any future trade deal between the U.S. and Britain. Trump's visit comes amid fierce protests against a U.S. leader, which includes a blimp portraying him as a big baby. Trump said he feels fine about any protests, but then later told the Sun newspaper that he felt unwelcome in London. South Korea's largest annual film festival kicked off on Thursday in Pucheon for a fantastic 11-day run. The 22nd Pucheon International Fantastic Film Festival features 290 films from 53 countries and has the theme Love, Fantasy and Adventure. The festival opened with the premiere of the film Underdog, a story of abandoned dogs directed by Oh Sung Yoon and Lee Chun Baek. For the first time in its history, the film festival also will screen nine North Korean feature and short films, including the family drama The Story of Our Home, which won the Best Movie Award at the 2016 Pyongyang International Film Festival. The festival closes on the 22nd with the touching family movie Secret Superstar by renowned Indian director Amar Khan. Good afternoon. It's going to be hotter than yesterday with highs ranging in the low to mid 30s. So more heat will be building up along with high humidity levels and heat wave alerts remain in place for much of the peninsula under mostly sunny skies. And Daegu will see highs soaring to 37 degrees Celsius over the weekend. So heat and humidity will make everyone feel uncomfortable. Take it easy today and drink plenty of water. Highs in the northern regions will be in the low 30s, getting up to 32 degrees Celsius here in the capital. Daegu and Gyeongju will make it to 36 degrees this afternoon. But no relief is on the way for a while. It's going to be very hot and humid under mostly sunny skies. And the southern regions will be 3 to 4 degrees hotter than here in Seoul. So stay in the shade and avoid outdoor activities unless it's absolutely necessary for next few days and be sure to pay special attention to your plants as well that's korea for you and here's international weather for beers around the world And that wraps it up for this edition of Arirang News. But we'll be back at 4 p.m. Korea time with the latest updates and more, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching and goodbye. Literally speaking, a comma in your life. Then, 
under a tree blowing in the wind. I look up.